Hey everyone, it's Michael Zapersky and welcome back to another episode of the Consulting Success Podcast. Uh, today, I am very excited to have Roger Martin joining us. Roger, welcome. It's great to be on, Michael. So Roger, you are the, the founder and president of Roger L. Martin uh, Incorporated. Uh, you're an advisor to CEOs around the world. Uh, you give keynote talks, workshops, uh, and you've worked with many very well-known organizations like P&G, Lego, Ford. And in 2017, you were named the world's number one management uh, thinker by Thinkers 50. You've written, I believe, 13, if not more books. Maybe it's number 13 oh, that just came 13. out. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the, yeah, the most recent, uh, A New Way to Think, Your Guide to Superior Management Effectiveness. So I thought we'd start off our conversation today uh, going back in time. Uh, you received your BA from Harvard College, your MBA from Harvard Business School, uh, PhD from Royal Military College of, of Canada. Uh, and you hear a lot about companies these days that pay a lot less attention to someone's kind of educational background and where they went to school and much more on their skills and kind of their, their experience. Can they code what, you know, the, whatever it is that they can do. And I'm wondering, how do you, how do you feel about that? Where, where do you feel, um, you know, is the value in formal education has your thinking around the role of that formal education changed over the years? Uh, I'd love your take on, on that. Sure. Although I do just want to make a slight, slight correction. That's an honorary doctorate from uh, uh, Royal Military College. So I don't want to. Thank you for I, I don't want to give the give the impression that I actually <laughs> worked my way through a PhD. That was uh, much easier to just get asked and go up and give a speech. So okay. which is great. It was it was it was it was it was lovely. But um, gee, that, I, I guess I guess I I think that um, formal education is is important. Um, but I, I guess I, I do think that, that, um, there are lots and lots of great universities. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, t I tell people because as people may or may not know it, uh, if you apply to Harvard college, you get an alumni interview. Uh, and so I've, and, and a loyal graduate does the interviews in their in their uh, in their area, and so I always used to do uh, alumni interviews. And what I would say to people is, don't fall in love with one university because uh, you're probably going to get disappointed because there are just so many people now applying for all the all the uh, you know more prestigious universities. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a bit of a crapshoot as to whether you're going to get in or not. Uh, fall in love with a class of universities at a certain like quality level or a certain kind little liberal arts colleges or big research universities fall in love with a category and then wait to see who you get into uh, uh to uh, to fall in love and that's because i i think you can do great things uh from all sorts of universities mm. you know that having been said i i think if you skip that i mean there are some some sort of high techie kind of people say, you know, teach yourself coding, don't, don't waste the time at a university for four, four years and the money. I don't subscribe to that view. I, I think you learn a whole lot and learn how to think and, and a lot of, a lot of things. And so that is, that is worthwhile. Past an undergrad, I, I think more education should be much more love oriented than mm. than functional like if you really like a subject a lot really enjoy the learning process go do it if you're getting graduate education because you think you're supposed to i don't think you'll do it all that well or get all that much uh out of it and so that that would be uh that would be my my advice but my advice in general is just learn from everything you do Right, so you can sleepwalk your way through four years of college and mm -hmm. not learn much of anything, not interact with people in a way that makes you a more well-rounded person or a more thoughtful person, or you can dive into it and engage in the experience. Uh, right. And so I would, that that would be more more my thought uh, than go to any specific school, uh, um, any specific discipline. No, it's more about the experience of learning. You started your career as a strategy consultant in 1981. Um, mm -hmm. Before that job, did you have 
any other jobs that you feel really impacted who you are today or were kind of a springboard for for your future and the success that you've achieved? Well, that, because I went directly from undergrad to business school, because you could do that in those those uh, now ancient days. Uh, I didn't have a, that was my first <clears throat> full-time job. I mean, I guess I had summer jobs. I mean, I, I, I always think that uh, I, I learned the most and many valuable lessons uh, around the kitchen table uh, mm. from my entrepreneurial father. Uh, so he started a business when I was two. So I have no recollection of when he wasn't running Wallenstein Feed and Supply Limited. Mm. Uh, and, um, uh, and so that's, so not, and I did work in the summers in the, in the feed mill. It was an animal, animal feed manufacturing uh, company. Mm. Um, I mean, I guess I, I learned very much about what, you know, hard labor type work, uh, kind of was slogging feed bags and filling them up and, and, uh, driving, driving trucks and said, said, you know, uh, I, I, you know, that's honorable work and then yeah. the like, but, uh, I I'd like to invest in ways of doing something that's more, more, um, kind of. Uh, mentally challenging for me. So maybe that's right. a lesson I learned. And Roger, so you, know, you often hear that um, our, you know, during our childhood years, so much of, of that influences kind of the, the beliefs that we have, or even the limiting beliefs that we have later on in, in life. And if you could kind of take me back to those days when you're sitting around the table with your, your family, your, your father is this entrepreneur. Uh, I'd love to hear, is there one thing that stands out to you that you remember that was either very inspirational or just had a big impact on you in a positive way. And there's, a, and then on the flip side, is there anything that any habit uh, around those conversations or anything that maybe your father did that you you're looking back, you look back on now, or maybe even you did it you know, earlier on and think like, I wish he wouldn't have done that or that, that caused some, some struggle for me. And, and I'm asking just to put this in context for the, in, for in the position of, everyone who's listening and joining us right now who are entrepreneurs, they're running their own consulting business, um, they, whether they have a team or, or they're solo, but they may have their, their children around them or, or others around them. And I'm, I'm wondering, are there any kind of habits, characteristics, behaviors, attitudes that are very positive, but also that, were, that maybe were negative and that you, therefore, people should avoid? Yeah, um, and and I and I also want to bring my mother into it because she was a equally sort of important in in lessons that I applied to business. Uh, I guess I, I'm fortunate in that I can't I can't think of any negatives. So so um, I will dwell on the positives on sure. on on this. So um, I would I ask Dad question after question about the business because I was curious. And mm. one thing that I liked is he always gave me a thorough answer. He never volunteered anything about the business. If you didn't ask him a question, there was nothing he would, he didn't come home to tell stories and regale us with stories about the business. Uh, that just wasn't his thing, his, mm. his, but his, he would answer all questions. And from him, I, yeah, I learned, uh, I guess probably, more system dynamics than anything else. And of course, he, he was just high school educated. He did not have a second of, of, of university. And in fact, he had, he had gone through high school in the sort of the, the non-university stream, right? The mm -hmm. commercial stream. Uh, so he wasn't highly educated, but man, he had a sophisticated understanding of system dynamics. So I'd, I'd ask him things like, you know, dad, I know you have a policy and your policy is at the start of a sales call, the salesperson hands the price list to the customer and on the price, it's got sort of every feed they make and what the price is depending on, on quantity. And there's a quantity discount, you know, if you order 20 tons, it's less than if you order half a ton. Uh, and, and uh, you never deviate off of that price list. Uh, and, and I sort of said, you know, that seems a little bit arbitrary and, uh, and what if, you know, that's, that's handed out. And so every farmer out there has got that week's price list. They can give it to the co competition and say, well, this is, this is what Wallenstein's offering. If you can beat it, I'll, I'll go with you. Um, 
what happens if somebody just under, undercuts you? Like, shouldn't you have some more flexibility? How old were you when you were asking these questions? Oh boy, I probably wasn't all that old. I was probably eight or 10 or something like that. Something it just, like it that. just strikes, so my, my eldest daughter is six years old and I'm just thinking about her asking a question like that. And it's just such a thoughtful question to be coming <laughs> from somebody that age. So sorry <laughs> well, to interrupt you, but yeah, please, please go no, on. No, 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 that's, that, that's quite all right. And so he says, he you know, would always start in the, well, Roger, uh, you know, here's the way, here's the way I think about it. It's, it's, you know, we want to win on the basis of the quality of our feed and, and our formulations that, that are, that help the animals, animals grow and our service. Cause service is a big deal, but, you know, making sure the you know, animals have the right, you know, protection to antibiotics. If there's problems, the sending out our vet, uh, uh, et, et cetera, setting out our nutrition experts. So we want to win on that, that basis. Um, uh, and so if price is always up for negotiation, 95% of the uh, sales call is going to be on price. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't want that. I want, that'll take away time from the message we want to send. But if the farmer knows there is not another farmer anywhere on the planet who's going to get a better price than what's on the list there will be no discussion about it they'll look at it and and just to check that we're getting in the we're getting, getting a, we're in the right column yes it's at this right. speed and th th this is my volume um, but then we can spend 100% of the sales call on the things we want to spend spend it on um, and you know we work really hard on having a really great cost position um, and so if somebody prices under us uh, they're, they're cross subsidizing. They mm -hmm. have to be charging somebody too much and we shouldn't be trying to win the farmer that they're cross subsidizing. We should be figuring out what farmer they're overcharging and go and get that, uh, customer. Right. So I was what, like, what a conversation. Okay. Then, <clears throat> so you're thinking about you know, now as a strategy consultant kind of guy, it's sort of like, yeah. you're thinking about sort of Nash equilibria, competitive dynamics, uh, 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 signaling, what gives the customer uh, confidence, what you want to have the salesperson uh, do. <laughs> so it's sort of like, hmm, you've actually thought about this a lot, uh, uh, dad, but it, it, it taught me, you got to think about a lot of things uh, to make a, uh, to make a decision. Yeah. Um, and, and, take into account a whole lot of dynamics. And so right. I think in my consulting career, I always paid a lot of attention to how the policies that you put in place will cause sort of selection bias in the way you want, right? This would cause farmers to want to engage on other things other than price. It would cause the farmers to have confidence it would have the it would cause the competitors to have to cross subsidize to to beat you all of those things are the result of a policy that seems highly inflexible and maybe kind of like a little bit doctrinaire and silly no mm -hmm. it's not uh, it has a very specific purpose so yeah. so that i learned that i learned from him but to not leave my mother out, that it says it's a great contrast. So dad would always answer my, always answer my question. I'd like, there was, I, and I was like, what am I, blah, 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 blah. You be, well, Roger, well, Roger. Mom, on the other hand, was exactly the opposite. I don't ever remember getting an answer to a question from, from, uh, from mom. Whenever I asked her a question, I would always get back this, the same. I'd almost roll my eyeballs to, uh, and she would say, well, Roger, what do you think? So, hey, mom, why was Auntie Delphine mad at uh, cousin Fred? Mm -hmm. uh, well, why do you think so, Roger? Right. right. And then I'd come up with something and then she'd explore that and the, maybe the positive and negatives of that. Is there anything else we should be thinking about and whatever? And eventually we'd get to an answer uh, and, uh, you know, and it was a good answer. And I really understood the answer because I half came up with it my, myself, but got nursed along with, with, uh, with her. Uh, so from, from her, I just, I learned the kind of the, the thinking process and to recognize that other people 
you don't need other people to come up with answers for you. Yeah, uh, it, you, it can, sounds... you can answer, you can create answers and the act of engaging with somebody else to help them create an answer is a sort of a, a noble uh, thing to do. So that, that, that was a bit from a bit from both that no, those shaped are... who I am. Those are great examples. It, it almost sound kind of remind me that of of your mom kind of working through a bit of a consultative selling process uh, or helping you to to ask great questions, which I, I think was is very powerful. So uh, that that's amazing. You so after working as a strategy consultant, you worked as a director for the Monitor Company, um, and you did that for a while. Then you went into teaching, and you were the dean of the Rotman School of of Management, from what I understand. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering why do you decide to to leave kind of the quote unquote business world. Uh, and get involved in, in education? Well, so yeah, so I was a, a strategy consultant for, for 17 years, most of, the, most of the time at Monitor Company and one of the, the small group of people who grew and led, led Monitor Company for that period. And that was sort of a big international classic strategy consulting firm. We competed with McKinsey, Maine, BCG. So we mm -hmm. were in many respects in one of the four companies in that era that that very large, like Dow Jones, 30 companies would trust with strategy advice. And I liked it. I, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, you know, I, I was a, a, one of the ownership group. So it was sort of like my company and the like. Uh, but I was, as I say, I was minding my own business consult. I, I, as part of that, I had, I had set up their Canadian office, Monitor Company Canada Limited. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, during that time, met a lot of Canadian executives one of them called me up to say uh i, I i'm on the board of this canadian company moore corp is that then then the world's biggest office forms company uh officially headquartered in canada as a canadian company but actually it's operating headquarters is in chicago um and so we need we need some help and sure enough i i went to work for them on the board and on the strategy committee of the board that we interacted with most was Rob Pritchard, the president of the University of Toronto, very charismatic. He was mm -hmm. sort of the boy president. He became president very young in age. And he sort of took a liking to me. And at the dinner that he held uh, at, his, at the president's uh, house, U of T, a huge president's house, he had a dinner for uh, the management uh, team in the board and he invited me along and at the end of the dinner when I was getting my coat he said I'm going to try and talk you into becoming the next dean of our business school so uh, now I'd always thought that if I had a successful business career I would turn to public service of some of some sort mm. uh, maybe when I was 50-ish maybe um, but I, I was 41 at the time and was not thinking about this for another decade but he was very persuasive and talked me into it. And, and so I did it very much for, for uh, patriotic reasons. By that mm -hmm. time, the you know, monitor company was dedicated to helping global companies be more globally competitive. And what I realized is that, that uh, you know, Canada didn't have a consequential global business school, like mm -hmm. a business school that was consequential on the global market. And, and if it really wanted to go, uh, grow consequential global companies that it needed a business school in Canada, not one that you had to go to go to a U.S. school, let's say, or European school if you're a Canadian. Right. And so I decided that I would attempt to help Canada have one, at least at least one consequential business school. So I gave up. I took a massive cut in compensation. 94% cut in compensation uh, wow. to do public service. So that's what that, that was uh, about. And, and you, were, you were married at that time? Yeah, married with uh, three kids. So I have to ask, and then I want to kind of take us back on, on track, but how, what was the reaction within the family of um, one, just making such a big shift? So you're on this track, you know, you, you're ownership and director and on boards and all that, and two, Hey, I'm going to be taking a 94% pay cut to try and grow this university. Was was everybody cheering for Daddy, or was uh, was was there con some concern when when you were considering that? No, I mean, my my wife was uh, born and raised in Toronto, so it was a bit of going home. 
Mm. And, the, and the kids remembered Toronto because they were born when I was up running Monitor Company Canada Limited. So, I mean, it, it, it was... Uh, it was disconcerting to a certain extent, but they had family and relatives. They weren't going to a strange town. They were going to a town that they understood. And, uh, and I guess, uh, uh my wife had enough confidence that we'd somehow figure out how to make uh, ends meet. I had done that to date. So, yeah. so, so, so be it. So okay. it wasn't, it wasn't that, yeah. that tricky. And then Martin, I have to ask you because then I know about 14 years after being the Dean um, of the, the Rotten School of Management, uh, you, you went back kind of to your business roots, right? So you left Rotman, you opened up your own consulting and advisory firm, which you still run today. And I'm wondering why, why make that shift? So you went from business, right, into kind of education and back in, into business. What was going well, on at, at sure. that time that made you decide to, to make that shift? Sure. So... So yeah, I ran, I was Dean of the business school for 15 years. Mm. I kept my fingers a little bit in a strategic advisory world while being Dean, because I felt it would keep me, keep me current with business trends and also help me not being dismissed by business people who I wanted to have involved in the school as, mm. as kind of just an academic, which they would often do, who doesn't really know how business works. So I kept my toes in it a little, a little bit. Uh, and then um, when I stepped down in 2015 from being Dean, uh, I had a sabbatical, a couple of years worth of sabbatical stored up. And sabbatical isn't what people think it is. They think it's a year off. It is not. Uh, it is a year of teaching relief. You don't have to teach at all and you're expected to actually do more, uh, do more research. Um, and, uh, and so during those two years, um, I got back to, instead of just resting and relaxing and uh, instead of teaching, I went back to, to a little more consulting. And there were just a couple of companies that I was working with that needed a little more help than usual. And, and I just recognized that I, I loved it. Mm. Like I, I missed it and I loved advising CEOs on strategy. Right. And so after the two years uh, of sabbatical were, were over, I had ramped up my, and, and, and the, the sort of the, just the technicalities of when you're on sabbatical, you can do whatever you damn well please. Uh, and, and, if you're on at University of Toronto, the rules are when you're on faculty, you can do 50 days of paid outside activity uh, a year. Um, and while I was dean, I never did more than 24 because I said, hey, you know, I've taken a giant pay cut uh, mm. to do something for my country. I'm not going to screw up doing that well by doing too much of my old thing. Uh, but during my, those two years of sabbatical, I ramped up my consulting to way more than 50 days a year. And then I realized, gee, I don't really want to go back. I don't want to stop doing this because I'm really enjoying it. And mm -hmm. so I went on uh, by, I guess that must have been, been maybe 15, 16 academic year because 13, 14 and 14, 15 would have been the sabbatical years to a 50% appointment, mm -hmm. uh, which I kept until 2019. And that enabled me to do as much consulting as essentially I, I uh, wanted. Right. Um, and so at that point, I was just doing, and then in 2019, I decided uh, kind of enough. Uh, I, I'm, uh, uh, I don't want to do any more academic administration. I actually don't want to do administration of any, anything. <laughs> right. I, I, want, I, I want to do my own thing, yeah. uh, which is, and the two things I love most, which is writing and advising CEOs. And so I went off the, down from my 50% appointment to zero retired in 2019 and have, have been, you know, full-time, you know, retiree from, from the faculty of university of Toronto uh, ever since. Have you ever had a challenge with marketing and, and getting clients? Um, it sounds like things were always pretty solid for you in that area that, there's always opportunities or were there some challenges uh, that you faced at one point or another running your con own consulting business in terms of getting clients and building a pipeline? 
No, not in the, not in this not in this era. I mean, in the, in the good old days, but Monitor was a startup in the early '80s, and people didn't know anything about us, and we didn't have a track record, and we were yeah. going against McKinsey, Ben, and BCG. That was hard as hell, uh, mm. absolutely. Um, but but you know, since since essentially go, going back to doing it. You know, kind of no, and and it's and it, and it's in part because I don't want to. If I if I were if I was trying right now to do like you know uh, at Monitor Company in the '90s, like I was one of the the, the the handful. There were actually three of us who were the biggest sellers of consulting mm. services in Monitor Company, and I okay. my my job was probably keeping something like 150 full-time uh hungry mouths fed with with business uh right. and so if i was doing that i'd have to think more about about marketing yeah. uh, but I, I don't want to do that i just i, I just want to you know do what i do and so so mainly mainly people hear about my work from somebody else or they read stuff that I've written yeah. uh, and just call me up uh, and and we decide whether whether or not it makes sense to work together and take it from there. So take me back though to those days of Monitor because a lot of consultants do find themselves in that situation. It, sometimes it's not the reality where you know they believe that they're competing against the McKinsey's and the Accenture's and, and all the other well-known firms. Um, and sometimes that's again, it's not even true. They just kind of think about that. But for you, it was true. You know, you were competing with these very well-known, well-established global firms. What did you do then to actually start winning business? If you kind of you know look back at that time uh, and maybe transport that information to today, uh, mm -hmm. are there any kind of best practices or ideas that you would suggest to uh, a, a consulting firm owner or a consultant? who wants to win business, but they feel like they are competing for business with more established um, alternative firms. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned Accenture. We created Accent Monitor Company created Accenture. Uh, we did this study for Arthur Anderson and Company and I don't remember what it was, 83 or 84, yeah. uh, where they were trying to figure out with audit and tax business, slowly but surely declining in kind of profitability, what else to do with their skills and capabilities. And we came up with the idea uh, with a study we did for Vic Millar, who then became the giant of that, the systems integration practice of Arthur Anderson and company, which became Anderson <laughs> Consulting, which became right. Accenture. So we, Amazing, so, we yeah. created, so we created that. So we created a competitor. They tried to buy us numerous times actually. Uh, but uh, well, I mean, the the, these are probably things your listeners all know, but one thing if you don't know is that is that by far and away, and it ain't even close, the best source of business is existing clients, right? Uh, you know, at one point I did a study of our clients, maybe ten years in, and said, where, where did these all come from? And they, and the vast vast majority of them came from somebody who we had done great work for, saying, "Gee." these these guys are, are are good and so so the absolute best way to market as a consultant and there isn't anything even close right mm. so this is so far above anything else that you could possibly think about doing uh from a marketing or sales standpoint is do great great work and maintain great relationships with your current clients so uh and that you're top of mind with those uh clients mm -hmm. even if you've stopped working with them you check in with them and so so when a friend of theirs calls and says i got this problem have you ever have you ever like hired anybody to do anything that's like anything similar to that they say oh monitor company or oh, roger martin right. uh, uh and and uh and if you if you're so busy marketing and selling that you don't pay attention to your current clients or you don't keep in contact with your current clients so that you're they, they don't have mental awareness as, as mm -hmm. we now we, we now have it have it uh, termed then you've just shot yourself in the foot and all the other marketing that you do uh is is uh is worthless uh, martin, uh, martin how much of that is roger so i'm sorry <laughs> thank you Roger, um, how much of, of that 
is you during that process, you actually reaching out and, uh, you know, asking your existing clients, like, did you have some sort of process in place to, to try and get more referrals or was it just, you just did great work. You didn't ask, there was no process in place and referrals just came to you. Correct. Okay. Wow. Um, Out, outbound, uh, I have found outbound marketing of at least m the kind of consulting services I, I do strategy is uh, worthless. Mm. Uh, and, and the reason is it's, it's so abstract, right? It, you know, what exactly is strategy? Mm. You, know, you know, most, most people who are in a position of buying it don't, don't can know that much about it. It's just like a doctor. It's like, like, you don't know what appendicitis feels or looks like they do. Uh, and, and, uh, and so what they need is somebody that says, these guys will take care of you mm. or this guy or this gal, whatever, this person will, will take care of you. So don't, don't worry about exactly what they're going to do. Uh, I might not even be able to explain it in terms that, that you, my friend care about, just trust me, they're good. Mm. And then you go in and, and, uh, and do something useful for them. And, yeah. you know, it all, it all works out fine. But I, 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 ceased at, at monitor company long 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 ago i ceased even thinking about out, outbound marketing advertising and you know all, all of that all of that uh, uh stuff the only useful thing you can do from an outbound standpoint is is uh is essentially if you will thought leadership right uh, writing stuff that people will read and say this guy sounds like he understands my issue or my, my problem. Yeah. It's a great uh, way to demonstrate value. Certainly without having a conversation with somebody for them to be able to, to read or consume any kind of IP that you've created or ideas or insights that you've, you've put out there. Um, so Roger, I want to, you know, your company is your name, uh, mm -hmm. which I just butchered a few moments ago and, and mixed, you know, flip the two. So I apologize. About no, that. lots of people do that. I yeah. have two, um, two, uh, two, uh, <laughs> two first names as my name. Yeah. So, um, you do have a team that supports the work that you do, uh, but is it correct that you're you're the one providing, you know, the keynote talks, the workshops, the advisor, advisory services? It's it's all you, or mm -hmm. are any okay? Have you ever? I mean, you, you kind of touched on this a moment ago, but I'd love to dig a little bit deeper. Which is, have you ever thought about, you know, building a business with a team? So in terms of your own consulting firm and what you provide where you have team members that can also deliver the services, and so it's not only you. What what are your kind of your your thoughts on that? Well, I, one, I did that once. We had a, you know, thousand person firm when I, when I left about probably 700 consultants. Um, and so I'd sort of been there and done that and didn't, didn't want to do it before. And, mm. and, and, you know, I, I had, I have a, a you know, a bittersweet memories of monitor. I mean, it was my home and I helped build it and it was a great, great firm, but we got into business with the, with the fundamental idea that unlike the other consulting firms whose business is selling projects, selling consulting services, uh, that our view was great strategy should come from within. And our job is to do strategy assignments mm. with the company in a way that while doing the assignment teaches them how to do it themselves so that they are actually less dependent rather than more dependent you get more mm. dependent when you say wow those mckinsey guys or those bain guys are just so smart and the next time we have a pro problem we gotta uh, phone them up again that right. was our that was our our rationale uh that was our our belief belief system and we believed it and we did that for a while but then then we you know we would hire you know, scores of people and head up pyramid and head offices and head hungry mouths to feed. And when clients said, can you do this? And can you do this? And can you do this? We would say, oh, yes, 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 yes. And I realized uh, that we were falling away from the, 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 where we started with our philosophy. And it, it started to become apparent when, when uh, Sears Roebuck and company became a $10 million a year client in 1990. Mm. 
which would be the moral equivalent given pricing of probably a $40 million client, let's say today. Uh, and then AT&T became a $50 million client in 1995. So that would probably be a you know $150 million client today. And then Merck by 1998, by the time I left was an $80 million client. And that's mm -hmm. just professional fees, not out-of-pocket expenses, reimbursables. And I said, we have, we have lost our way uh, and we have a cost push uh, force mm -hmm. that is pushing us to do. You're not teaching Merck how to do you know, a strategy on their own when you're billing them $80 million a year. No way. And so when I thought about it, I thought, yeah, and lots of people came to me because they liked me as a, as a leader and I was very popular and beloved leader at monitor company to, you know, create another mini monitor company. And I thought long and hard about it and said, we had the best of intentions, but the minute that you have got a pyramid under you, you sell to feed the beast. Uh, and, and I don't, I don't want to do that. Uh, and so I said, there's only one way to stop to stop that. And that's to have nobody. Uh, and so I have nobody. Uh, I, I mean, I have, I have the, my, you know, the, the people who on the administrative right. side of the business are enormously, you know, helpful. My COO and general counsel, I kind of have about two, two people who help with scheduling and billing and all that who are, who are fabulous and an accountant and whatever I've, I, I've got, I've got lots, lots of people, not lots. I got a handful of people who help me, but they do not provide consulting services. I provide consulting services. And so I right. have to get clients to do the vast majority of stuff. That's, yeah. I have no choice. So I noticed, I mean, I think, I believe your, your wife is a lawyer. Uh, she also serves as the company's kind of COO. Um, and yeah. you have a legal analyst, you have also an executive assistant, maybe one, one or two other people. Two, two sort of, e, two sort of EAs. Yeah. So, I mean, to me, that, that is also very strategic, right? You're, you're, it sounds like creating a lot of leverage so that all the things maybe you don't like to do or you're not good at doing or just aren't your highest value kind of creation areas you have others focused on. So for, for you, does that mean that all of your time is spent either just working directly with clients or, or writing, or is there something else that you're spending your time on? Um, no, that's, no, just that's, those two things. It's, it's those two things for the most part. I mean, there's some coordination obviously with, uh, sure. with uh, my GC and some coordination with my, my two, uh, uh, two EAs, but but for the most part, I just I just advise advise CEOs and write. Yeah, and I like both of those activities. Right. Well, let's let's talk about your your latest book, uh, A New Way mm -hmm. to Think. Um, how do you come up with the with the title? Kind of where did that idea of a new way to think come from? Um, you know, it uh, in this in this case, uh, it it went through. Sometimes I I have an like an exact title. Uh, in mind, you know, kind of long, long before the words are are are, are written. This has sort of evolved along the way. Um, um, at one point, it was memos to a CEO to CEO uh, because I'd written lots of the what's in the book originally were a memo to a C, to a CEO. Uh, but I I just came to the conclusion that in in each of the chapters had the had the similar format. Which, which I standardized to a greater extent when I, when I came to this, this view, which is they, they explained why the current model that was dominantly used was not producing the results desired. Mm -hmm. Not, don't use this model because it produces results I don't like. It's you want to produce uh, result X, you apply the model, you get Y. Uh, not X. Uh, so why why is that happening? It's because you got the wrong model, and here's a better model. And mm. so it was. Here's a new way to think about fourteen different uh, areas. Got it. Uh, you mentioned that you just you love working with CEOs, helping them, you know, with with strategy leadership. Uh, what do you see as the most common mistakes that CEOs and even kind of lumping into that, if we if we can, or feel free to separate them. Uh, consultants or or advisors. What what are the biggest mistakes that people make, kind of in the areas of of strategy to begin with? Well, I mean, the biggest one on strategy is to do planning instead of strategy. Mm -hmm. um, that's probably, I mean, I, unfortunately, I think 
probably no more than 15% of Fortune 500 CEOs have a useful definition of strategy. So how can you do strategy if you don't even know what it, the definition of it is? And it's not because they're dummies or anything. They're taught this. They're taught this in business school. The whole environment is a strategy uh, is actually a plan. And the, the most common characteristic of any plan is, is the person responsible for it, the CEO or the head of corporate planning goes around to every part of the business and asks what initiatives they want to engage in and comes up with a list of initiatives that are all, all sensible. They're rarely really stupid. They're all kind of sensible in their own way. And they say, that's our strategic plan. Mm. And they often refer to them as strategies. We have 20 strategies. Uh, right. The Asia division is going to build a plant. The, you know, the HR is going to hire some talent, uh, you know, what, whatever. Um, and then kind of bad things happen out in the marketplace. Uh, and they're like, gee, we had a thorough strategic plan. What, what went wrong? Well, the answer is you didn't have a strategy. You didn't have right. a set of choices that were integrated uh, and have as their output uh, picking a field of play on which you're going to play where you will be better than all your competitors. Is will. that your definition of, of strategy or is there any other mm -hmm. way that you would define it for, for people? That's the tightest definition of strategy I, I have. I, I have to say strategies is the answer to five questions. You kind of, what's our winning aspiration? Where are we going to play? How are we going to win? What are the must-have capabilities we need to, to uh, have? And what are the enabling management systems that will build and maintain the must-have capabilities to win where we've chosen to play to meet our winning aspiration? That's strategy. If people just spent the time to answer those five questions, how much further ahead do you think they would be than most of their competitors in the marketplace? Uh, because the, the practice of strategy is so pathetic, uh, just answering those five, five questions would, would put them out ahead. Now, I mean, as with any framework whatsoever, you can answer them right in the most sort of, you know, rote, dull, drone-like way or mm -hmm. with some real thought. And I'd say some real thought wouldn't hurt. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, the well, practice I, of strategy I, on, on average, uh, I would, in, in, out in the world, yeah. uh, the practice of strategy, I would give somewhere between a C and a D uh, yeah. grade. And Roger, when you think about, as people kind of work through those five questions and give consideration to them, what, what are the most common mistakes that they make or what are the things that maybe they, they overlook that they should really pay more attention to? Well, one big mistake is they do them individually. They say what, you know, they go to an offsite and come up with vision, mission, whatever, to fill in that winning aspiration box and say, mm -hmm. I'm done. Then they go and make a list of all the places that they could play. And then they pick some places and say they're done. Then they get to how to win. And often that's where they get bogged down then because they realize they can't win in a way that's consistent with the winning aspiration where they've chosen to play. Mm. But they're kind of stuck because they've locked and loaded on those. So mm. what you have to do is, is constantly vary them and, and think about a set of five that fit together and reinforce each other. That's, that's, the, that's the single biggest mistake. I mean, I would say the other, other mistake is just, to, is just to feel like you're in a chess match against nobody, right? So you can come up with all these, I'm gonna move here and move here and move here. And they're not gonna be thinking right. about anything. My comp competitors are just gonna stand there and, and wait around until I, until I annihilate uh, them. When, while you're doing everything you're doing, they're doing a bunch of stuff to try and do the same thing to you. And so they don't take into account mm -hmm. that competitive dynamic. I would say those are probably the two, the two biggest ones. And is there ever a time where you, you feel an organization should not pay attention to the competition. They should just, they know the competition is out there. They, you know, they have a sense and an idea of like what they do, but their strategy should not really be thinking too much of the competition. They should just be focused on, on them and making themselves better. Or is it always important to consider how you have a, an advantage over the competition? Yeah, I, I, I can't think of a, a situation where ignoring your competition is a good idea, mm. right? 
being cowed by your competition, obsessed about your competition. Okay, I would I would say those things aren't aren't helpful. But ignoring them entirely. Um, you see, I think paying attention to your competition helps you hone and refine and make more specific still uh, your strategy and what it means. Mm. Um, um, you know, you sort of need reference points to be specific. Okay, what would cause us to spend $2 million on this rather than $1 million on, on, on this? aspect of our of our strategy mm -hmm. oh you know it's because we're going to win against them on scale we've got the capacity to spend two million when they are going to find one million as much as possible and so yeah that's why spending two is is important and of course right. that's sort of a very blah kind of example but uh, in an attempt to be generic but uh it just helps you helps you be precise and specific on your on your strategy and so i mean as you mentioned i I've, i feel i feel the same way that strategy is a word that people just throw around without really understanding it oftentimes right so you mentioned people kind of interchange strategy and plan i also see tactics and strategy being interchanged all the time uh, mm -hmm. people are talking about a, a tactic but they're actually describing it as a strategy is there um a point at which strategy is is maybe uh, premature like so take the solo consultant should they be thinking about strategy like do you think about strategy in in your own business roger or is strategy like really having a process and making the time to to think strategically or to to develop a strategy is that in your mind only when you reach a certain level of complexity or size or infrastructure H how do you kind of feel about about that no well, I, I mean, I, I guess, and I've written, I've written about this. I, I, I say, everybody, every single organization, every person, has a strategy. We don't make random choices. When you decide, I'm gonna, you know, kind of, I don't know, get a sandwich now. Right. That's a that's a choice, right? Yeah. You didn't. You, you you don't. There's not a random number generator in your head that says sandwich time. Uh, there is sort of one in your stomach that says grumble, grumble, right? Um, but it, it, you make choices. So, so you can't not have a strategy. So it doesn't matter how little you are or big you are, you have a strategy is what you do. The only question is, what was the thinking process behind that, that caused it, those choices to add up to something that you'd want? Mm. Right? Um, so, so yeah, like I, you know, um, RLMI has a strategy. It's, a, it's, it's an extremely clear, clear uh, 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 strategy. I do some things and I don't do other things. And when somebody calls, I uh, operate in one way, not a, not another way. My dad, when he started Wallenstein Feed and Supply, when it was tiny, 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 had us had a strategy. Could have he articulated it? Probably not. Right? A lot many entrepreneurs can't always articulate why they're doing what right. they're doing. Um, you know, I think by the time I was asking him questions, he always had a good answer to every question, but I'm, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure that he did day, day one, although there are probably some things he did day one that, that uh, were kind of extremely strategic. Yeah. So I think, I think, you know, your, your question sort of has some of the some of the attributes behind the question are the this uh, are influenced by the dominant view of strategy which is its planning and so if you're little do you have time to plan well that's because the uh, strategic planning is big long onerous generally useless uh right. and and so no as a little company you don't have time to do something big long onerous and useless mm -hmm. uh, but you will make decisions uh, and so that's that's your strategy. And then there's also a connotation about strategy that says, unless you've done a whole bunch of analysis, you don't have a strategy. And and uh, you know, again, I think that's a red herring. You know, that's not what defines a, a a strategy. Bigger companies where they're spending more billions of dollars on initiatives and have a board of directors that they have to assure that they're being thorough will do more analysis for, for for their strategy choices than a than two kids in a garage sure but 
the two kids in the garage may beat the snot out of the, the gigantic company because their, their logic behind the choices they've made is more robust than the right. logic behind the big bureaucratic company. And we've seen that play out many times in uh, over history, right? Some, uh, so Roger, before we wrap up, I want to make sure that people can, um, you know, learn more about you. I want to encourage everybody to, to check out your books. You have a lot of work, you know, a lot of uh, Harvard um, business review publications and, and other ones you put out there before you do that, just a couple of quick questions, uh, for you, you know, in the role that you play for you, for you to feel like, you know, you're making the impact you want to have creating the success that you want to create. What are one or two kind of habits, uh, or things you do on a, on a regular basis that you feel contribute most to, to your focus, to your progress that you're able to make and, uh, to the impact that you're able to have. Well, one is really understanding what customers feel that they need hmm. right um because if i don't know what they really need uh, and what they really care about it's hard for me to focus on on that right yeah i'll focus randomly kind of um and and, and, uh, and how do you how do you identify that is it just just having just conversations asking with them, them a lot yeah yeah asking them a lot it's not about solving the problem that I think they need to solve. It's more about solving the problem they think needs mm. to be solved. Even if they're not completely right, you've got to earn in with a client by helping them where they're at. And once you've earned in, they will increasingly say to you, Roger, this is what I think we should be working on, but what do you think? And when they ask you that, then you offer it. But before they ask it, don't offer Mm. Um, and so, so that's a habit. I, I, I try to go back to say, okay, what client identified problem am I helping them solve? And if I don't have a really good answer, uh, to that, I say, then how exactly Roger, are you going to do stuff that will be helpful? You don't know what help means and you're going to try and do something. What you're going to do is help that if that were Roger. If that were Roger there, this would be helpful to that Roger. Well, no, it's not. It's Bill or, or Jim or Sally or whoever right. uh, that you're trying to help. So that, that I guess, would be, would be one. And then the second one is, is, am I working on the very hardest aspect of the problem in question? Biggest difference between super successful people and not so successful people is not so much that they know what the 10 biggest problems facing them uh, are in whatever situation they're currently in. They can both list them and be fairly accurate on the 10. Less successful people start at number 10 and work their way up. More successful people start at number one and work their way down. Um, and the good thing about starting with number one and working your way down is that often when you've solved number one, you didn't realize it, but it actually partially or entirely solved number four and number seven. And when you did right. number two, it also made number nine and 10 go away. And so you get more over the hump of problems than not. And it turns out if you start from number 10, uh, it doesn't make anything above it go away. Uh, and nine doesn't make anything above it uh, go away. And so you keep on having more big problems and you get overwhelmed. So I want to work on the big client's behalf. What is the biggest problem mm -hmm. they would like to see solved? That's how I try to keep myself. And Roger, how do, you, how do you identify what is the biggest problem? Is it just simply asking the client or is it, do you have certain factors or considerations when identifying what is the biggest problem? I start from where they start, uh, but, but often they don't, they don't know exactly and they'll give their hypothesis and then they'll say, what do you think, Roger? And then I can, I can say, well, it could be this. What do you think about that? And then, and then they, they'll say, well, I don't know about that, but what about this? And you get into a dialogue. Right. Um, but you, you have to have, it's like doing linear programming. If you don't have an objective function, you can't, you can't have, a, have a solution. You right. need an objective function. What problem are we trying to solve? Uh, it's a good discipline. Uh, yeah. I always ask it before I go into any meeting. Say, okay, what what problem are we trying to solve in this meeting? Right? And if the answer is the hell if we know, then you're wasting people's time. You should just disband the meeting or have a conversation about what problem we're trying to solve. 
Uh, Roger, you've written 13 books. Uh, my final question before directing people to learn more about you is in the last six months or so, what is one book that you've either read or listened to, could be fiction or nonfiction, that you would recommend? Oh, boy, I'm not sure I've read, read a book in the last six months. I don't read very much, which is very tragic, but uh, I... What, 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 yeah, well, if you're but, not reading very but, much, but, what, what but do you do? The, the, so, uh, <laughs> the, the last book that I really like, liked yeah. uh, uh, was The Social Limits to Growth by a guy named Hearst. So just yeah. a fantastic book that had me thinking a lot more about mm. economic, economic growth in a different way. It's the book that introduced the notion of positional goods. Um, so a positional good is a good that if I have it, you don't, you can't. Um, mm -hmm. So a positional good is, back to college, is, is a position in the freshman class at Harvard, right? Somebody else can't have it if I, if I have it. Mm -hmm. Facebook page is not, a, is not a positional good. I can have one, you can have one, anybody, right. uh, anybody can have it. Down. And, uh, um, you know, uh, I don't know what the most prestigious shorefront property in Vancouver area is, where it would be, where it would be, uh, where people want to have a, uh, oceanfront property in Vancouver. Oh, uh, well, I mean, there's, there's point gray. There's... Okay. Point gray. So, so point gray then would be a positional good. Do you have a cottage on point gray or a house on point gray? Yes or no. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's just a fascinating book about the economics of positional goods uh, that I'd never, that I'd never thought about and the dangers, the great dangers right. of, of, of positional goods and how they limit the growth of a, an economy. So that one, that one would be, uh, that one would be my, uh, my book of recommendation though uh, you know uh, if you haven't read art as experienced by by john dewey uh you'll be a less good consultant um art of experience by john dewey art we'll art, art yeah. as experience by uh, john dewey painfully difficult book to uh to read but <laughs> verb, verb. Uh, yeah. He's one of the greatest American. He's you know Dewey Decimal System, whatever right. among their other other of his of his uh, 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 creations. Um, but yeah, those well, would be we fun. we will we'll have that linked up uh, in the show notes, Roger. Uh, finally, I want to make sure that people can learn more about you, your work, all of your your sure. writings because you have a lot of content. Uh, where's the best place for them to go? The, for for my content, I've got it all nicely organized on my on my uh, website, and that's just www.rogerlmartin.com. You've got to include the L for Lloyd, named after my father, because if you do rogermartin.com or send an email there, it'll be to a Houston real estate agent who is an extremely nice man. He and I have gotten to know each other because he gets so much email and he always uh, dutifully forwards it to me. So I send him free copies of my books and everything. And we've got good. But I do not want people bothering Roger Martin of Houston. So rogerlmartin.com, uh, 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 Twitter uh, at Roger L. Martin. Uh, and for any strategist out there, uh, I have now uh, just finished my, I forget if it, 89th uh, article in the playing to win practitioner insights series on medium so if you go to medium and type in playing to win you'll get you'll get uh, over now two books worth of essentially practical follow-up to my playing to win book that i wrote with uh, with ag laughing well fantastic roger thank you so much for coming on and uh just sharing some of your, your journey and and lessons with us all here today it's my pleasure thanks for having me